Good morning. I'm Patrick Moynihan, the Associate Director of International Methods at Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C., here in the United States. I'm recording this presentation on Saturday morning, May 16th. However, I hope to join you all shortly for the Q&A at the end of the panel. I'd like to start by thanking the conference organizers and the university for hosting this event. In the following presentation, I'll highlight some of the key features of the center's response to the COVID-19 crisis, both domestically and in our international surveys. And then I'd like to share a few thoughts about possible ways forward with our global projects. I think we can all agree that there are many uncertainties right now in the survey environment, and that the impact of the outbreak will unfold in different ways across countries and regions. For us at Pew Research, we will need to stay connected with our in-country partners and remain flexible in our strategy to determine the best way forward. International polling may be different after the pandemic, and to the extent it does change, the center will need to adapt. For those unfamiliar, Pew Research Center was established in 1996 with funding primarily from the Pew Charitable Trusts, but we also received support from other foundations. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan fact tank the center includes a number of research projects focusing on different aspects of social, political, and economic life, along with two dedicated survey methodology teams. Over the past few months, we've adapted to the pandemic to cover its far-reaching impact. Now, let me share a few examples of what we've done. Here is a screenshot of our dedicated COVID-19 landing page, including all releases regarding the outbreak and a link to a data access gateway, and I'll say more about that on the next slide. Since mid-March, we have produced more than 50 reports and articles, all of which can be found on this page. Recent reports have covered issues ranging from the U.S. public's view of the federal response to COVID-19, changing levels of psychological distress, and partisan views of news coverage of the pandemic, among others. We're uploading our data regularly to the data tool via our American News Pathways project webpage. Full data sets and interactive analyses are available, so our data is user-friendly for the public. We've also cut down on the time for posting data, now typically within a week or so. Helping to make these responses to the pandemic possible is our data source the National Probability-Based Online Panel, the American Trends Panel, or ATP. Created in 2014, ATP is now the center's primary vehicle for U.S. data collection with more than 13,000 adults. Always an asset, having a tested, methodologically rigorous form of survey data collection right now that doesn't increase public health or personal safety risks is invaluable. To respond to current demand, we're now surveying ATP in about one week in comparison to the typical two-week field period. This means greater survey frequency. For instance, in April, we surveyed three times in a single month for the first time in ATP history. Generally speaking, our ATP response rates are about the same now as before, but the responses seem to be coming in faster. In other words, we're getting as many responses, and in some cases, even more responses in less time. Now let me turn to our international polling, where the situation is a bit more complicated. So you know, cross-national surveys have been a staple of the center for nearly two decades, primarily through the annual Global Attitudes Survey since 2001. Global Attitudes is usually fielded in 20 to 40 countries each year, translated into more than 40 languages, and designed to be nationally representative of adults using both face-to-face -face and phone methods. Just so you know, in terms of questionnaire content, the Global Attitude Survey covers many topics listed on this slide. Each year is a mix of new questions on issues of the day and trend questions from previous years, which allow us to leverage our time series data to provide greater context to current attitudes. In terms of geographic coverage, here's a map showing the countries we've polled in since 2001 across all center projects, 108 countries in total. 
The shaded areas indicate countries we've surveyed in, with the different colors simply indicating different regions of the world. The unshaded countries are the ones we have not polled. To provide a sense of the depth of a single year's polling for global attitudes, consider last year's wave. It was conducted across 34 countries with field work over six months, totaling over 38,000 respondents. In general, samples include about 1,000 adults, and it's based on both phone and face-to-face -face interviews. And it's the mode of data collection that's of particular significance right now. While there may be many issues to surveying during this pandemic, it's our widespread use of face-to-face -face interviewing internationally that's presented the greatest challenge. And that's due to the specific nature of coronavirus transmission. Primarily, it appears, spread mainly from person to person when they're in close contact, which is typically how face-to-face -face interviews are conducted. To make that point about mode explicit, Here's our geographic coverage over the past five years across all center projects by mode. Those countries surveyed face-to-face -face are highlighted in blue and those by phone in green. Overall, about two thirds of our international polling is conducted in person entirely in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East and North Africa, but also much of Asia and Eastern Europe. So while we look to continue our polling in countries where surveys are conducted by phone, as well as our US polling that's continually, continuing, excuse me, primarily with the American Trends Panel, the center decided back in March that we could not proceed with face-to-face -face data collection since it placed interviewers and the persons they interacted with, including respondents, other household members, and people in local communities at risk of contracting coronavirus. In addition, this decision was made while governments began to issue stay at home and lockdown orders to restrict population movement. The situation is a stark reminder of how prevalent face-to-face -face interviewing is throughout the world and what it takes, especially in terms of the sheer number of people field workers interact with in their jobs. It's been said that interviewers are really the unsung heroes of survey research, and it's hard to argue with that. With face-to-face -face interviewing, we often ask field workers to travel between communities, walk local streets, and knock on the doors of randomly selected dwellings. Sometimes no one's there or the invitation is declined. Then it's off to the next household. If someone answers the door and is cooperative, several minutes can be spent randomly selecting an adult to take the survey. And that might require speaking to more than one member of a household. If that goes well, the interview can begin. Sometimes the interview may take place inside the home, sometimes at the doorstep. In either instance, a respondent and interviewer can be within a few feet of one another for half an hour or more. Once an interview is completed, the interviewer moves on to the next randomly selected house and repeats the process, rinse and repeat, over again. Over the fieldwork period, an interviewer can walk many streets, knock on many doors and interact with many people. That being the case, the center decided it was best to altogether eliminate the possibility that interviewers might unknowingly spread or contract coronavirus. For us, we continue to explore alternative high quality and cost effective means of data collection internationally. While the Global Attitude Survey conducts phone surveys in roughly a dozen countries each year, we are now more actively exploring the possibility of shifting to phone elsewhere. In general, there are pluses and minuses to using phone and face-to-face -face methods, but the heart of the matter is finding the best way to reach people and what works in one country may not work in another. While interviewing over the phone reduces concerns about social distancing and transmission to respondents in their communities, COVID-19 could still be an impediment to caddy field work. If, for instance, the virus and government lockdowns remain widespread, call centers may be shut down. While some call centers are ready to shift staff to work from home with comparable quality standards, not all have a tested system for at-home phone interviewing and can show they are able to maintain data privacy standards. In the absence of efficient and effective phone surveys, the center is likely to return to face-to-face -to -face as the primary mode of international data collection 
once the pandemic has subsided. But precisely if and when face-to-face -face operations can return to normal is unclear, and if there is a new normal, it's not clear what that might be, and again, what's the new normal in one place might not be the same in another. Local restrictions on the movement of interviewers may persist after national governments end their states of emergencies. And in the coming months, it may prove more difficult to find people willing to open their door to a stranger, especially one wearing a mask over their nose and mouth, and possibly wearing other personal protective equipment. Many questions abound, which I'm sure are on the minds of most researchers today. Will respondents be more or less reachable during and after the pandemic, more or less cooperative, more or less motivated to engage with survey content? Will there be differential non-response across segments of a population? How representative will data be? How comparable will time series data be post-pandemic? Given the economic downturn happening in many countries, it's possible that some local polling firms may not survive the pandemic, which may leave some regions with little local capacity. Market conditions may be similar to before or not. If the cost per interview for a face-to-face -face surveying remains competitive after the pandemic and similar behavioral norms prevail, then many firms may revert back to face-to-face -face methods. Still, there may be lingering tensions between data quality concerns, economic pressures, and public health priorities. All told, we're likely to learn a great deal from each other in the coming months, making forms like this one all the more important. Here's my name and contact information. Please don't hesitate to contact me directly with any comments or questions. I look forward to hearing from you via email or during the Q&A toward the end of this session. Thanks again to the other members of the panel, conference organizers, ANU, and the audience. Thank you for your attention. Stay safe and keep in touch.